So this is the fifth lecture so far on um, Russian memes, and I really appreciate your being here. I'm basically just keep doing this as long as people keep showing up. Um, so, so here we go. Um, so if you remember, those of you who were here last week uh, would remember that my focus on cars um, was touching just a tiny bit on a theoretical question about, you know, what can be considered the internet, the, you know, now that the internet goes with you everywhere and the idea that particularly in Russia, the, inter the uh, cars could serve as a kind of um, extension of the internet out in, in the so-called real world. Um, my focus today is uh, really the opposite. It's, um, it is very much the internet at home where sadly we all are. Um, instead of us going out in the world and circulating with the internet, um, we are at home and the internet is doing all the circulating for us. Um, so obviously, as, as just today's format shows, the internet has become even more important um, in our lives and in our communications. Um, and during the coronavirus, so this is one of those times that I want to think about the internet itself and the Russian use of the internet in particular. Um, I want to think about the, um, the phenomenon of memes as an international um, phenomenon, that is the ways in which uh, memes uh, cross not just geographic borders, but language borders. Um, and um, also, um, as often comes up in these talks, I want to think about the connection between memes, viral videos, and politics in the, um, in the linguistic cultural ecosystem that um, the memes originate from. Because um, as in America and in so many other countries, uh, the virus is a challenge to political leaders who think entirely in terms of narrative and of faking reality. Um, and in a way, um, you know, with, with Trump, one of the obvious arguments is that he's um, treating um, reality as if it's a um, reality television show, which is, of course, his native genre. Um, and that, I think, is absolutely um, on target. But um, there is this funny phenomenon where we're all on the internet all day talking about, um, talking about the ways in which uh, virus um, the ways in which the virus challenges our ability to actually try to restructure reality when we're stuck on the internet and not really in reality. Um, if you think in terms of um, Lacanian theory, Lacan um, divide, then I'm not going to get into, don't, don't be scared by Lacan, he's just going to be here for just a moment and then he's going to go away. Um, he divides, um, he divides everything into three realms, um, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the, the real. Um, the imaginary and symbolic are two different uh, ways in which we, um, in which we turn um, what could be real things into stuff we talk about, into discourse, into symbols, into images, um, and they become something we can manipulate without actually referring to actual reality. Um, on the internet, we're usually dealing with the imaginary and the symbolic. Um, but the real challenge here is that right now we're living through a huge revenge of the real um, because, oh, and I was going to share, because the virus um, just does not care what we say about it or what we think about it. Um, and let me share the screen right now, please, for a second. The virus really doesn't care about us at all. Um, in mimetic terms, the virus is like uh, Cartman from South Park. It's going to do what it wants. Um, so we're, our response on the internet is so far from the real because there's not much we can do on the internet to challenge the virus to help. We can donate money, we can do political organizing, we can whine and complain, certainly. Um, but most of us, certainly any of, anyone who's computer, um, we're fortunate enough to be detached from the actual phenomena of what's happening here. So the virus for us, for mo many of us, is both real and not real at the same time, if we're lucky. We can pretend it's not real. And our memes, by definition, transform the real virus into something that is imaginary symbolic, something we can play with, something that's not threatening, um, and something that we can make mean something besides simply um, death and economic destruction. Um, we turn the virus by turning it into representation or by representing it obliquely. Now, none of this is unique to America, to Russia or to America. It's a, it's a common context. Um, and it's something that um, really um, comes up again and again when we think about the internet because we're talking about social, social distancing and aren't we always socially distanced on the internet? This is, this is the sort of thing that science fiction has been imagining for quite a while, particularly novel from the 1950s, The Naked Sun, where he imagines an entire world where people never see each other in person and are repulsed by the aid of in-person contact and only, um, only get in touch with each other holographically. Um, but one has to ask, though, if we're going to talk about Russia, what's unique about the Russian context? And in some cases, it's simply a matter of using Russian material, as we have here with the St. George's icon and the, um, the thermometer, which is, I think, a really great um, image. Um, we also have some nice moments when Russian content 
um, spreads across the world. A lot of people have noted that after 9-11, um, the big poem that was circulating around the internet in English um, was by Auden, and now the big poem that was circulating a great deal on Facebook is a poem by Brodsky saying, you know, don't go out of the room, don't go out of the room. He was not talking about viruses, obviously, but it seemed quite apposite. We're gonna come back to Brodsky a couple of times throughout here. Um, another thing that could be seen as different about Russia is, while um, Russia for the past few decades has been enjoying or not enjoying um, a lot of the same um, catastrophe, pandemic-themed uh, entertainment as, as we have here in the West, Contagion and so on and so forth, um, until recently it produced very, very little of it. And it just so happens that just in time for coronavirus, um, uh, Russian... Uh, Russian TV, well, really on, um, on, a, in, on a streaming platform, but Russian TV produced um, what I think of as the 21st century first big Russian um, pandemic entertainment, which is an adaptation of Yuri Wagner's um, Van Gogh, translated into English as The Lake, um, a eight-part miniseries called Epidemic. Um, started airing in November um, and finished in January, really just in time to get people really scared um, for the real thing. A coincidence, but a great one. Um, Another local feature to think about um, is, um, as we always do when we talk about Russia, which we, um, we end up thinking about the Soviet context and the Soviet past and how relevant it is. And Russian emigres in the West, um, on numerous occasions already I've seen on the internet, um, have written about um, how the uh, shortages that we're seeing now and the panic buying we see, say, in America and other countries reminds them of their Soviet upbringing. Um, quite famously, recently in The New Yorker, um, we have this article, How My Soviet Mom Prepared Me for the Pandemic. And it really resonated with a lot of people um, who grew up in the Soviet Union um, and more things. Um, but the funny thing is that I would argue that in Russia, most of the people who are actually creating memes and viral content right now on the internet have very little or no memory of Soviet experience. It's all indirect. Um, it's all secondhand, um, maybe less secondhand than it is for those of us who grew up in America, but it really isn't um, necessarily their go-to um, gut level um, connection. Um, ironically though, what they do remember, um, many of them do remember, is the 90s. Um, and so there's a video that's been circulating um, that I wanna show you uh, where the, the um, header is during the quarantine, in Italy, the dolphins are uh, returned. In Wales, the wild goats returned. And in Russia, um, the 90s came back. And this is what we see in the video. I think it's, that's really enough of that video because you kind of get it. Um, but the, the 90s experience is not so much a scarcity of goods, but a scarcity of money and a scarcity of public order. That is that particular video response to the chaos um, more than a response to the shortages. Those shortages, of course, as in um, the West, have become, a, have become fodder for, for um, parodic and mimetic content. Um, so as we see here, um, Toilet paper, this is a, a famous painting that has been transformed into a, a pile of toilet paper. Um, here, I think this one might've started out as English, I'm not sure. Um, life is great, because you're surrounded by toilet paper. Um, and then there's a particularly, um, one particular uh, Russian reaction, which is that in addition to toilet paper, Russians went out and bought um, grechka, a kind of kasha, um, and as the, as the staple, which I don't think people in America did. So this became um, a recurring joke. And here's some guy in a hazmat suit basically saying, um, I, I'm off to get some, 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 um, some kasha. Um, or here, um, uh, hey, hey there, um, hey there, you person who's panicking. I'm, a, I'm, a mo I'm the moth named Aleftina. I'm here for your grechka. So, you know, you can hoard and it's not going to really matter very much. Um, and this one says, existence, March 2020, coronavirus, my plans for the year, um, the ruble rate, um, uh, remote connection, and Grechka, the um, Kasha. And the image here, I believe, is from the end of um, Fight Club, when um, the main characters watch as, uh, as buildings are being blown up by their own terrorist organization. Okay, so... We also have in Russia, as in elsewhere, um, denial of the virus as a real phenomenon. Um, but the 
examples, the, the video examples of denialism that I, that I see that are particularly interesting um, have a feature to them that um, is a little different from what we see here. Um, I want to show you two um, videos of people um, denying the coronavirus. The first one I subtitled, the second one I didn't, but um, I, th I think we can do without the subtitles for that one. So let's go to the um, Да, Трамп, ты сегодня выиграл. Все страны закрылись друг от друга. Ты что ты натворил во всем мире? Так вот нет никакого коронавируса. Это политика тобой придуманная. Вот мы это его сегодня разорвем. А вируса как не было, так и не будет. Во всяком случае, не просто во всем мире, а в нашей стране его нет. Мы его сжигаем. Мы сжигаем его. Мы его сжигаем, этот коронавирус. Его не было и не будет. Все. Все, сожгли. Страна освободилась. Очистилась. Очистилась. А это все политика, а не болезнь. Политика бизнеса. Придуманная Трампой, Америкой. Все страны перевернулись вверх. Зато поднялся его дорог. That's how Russia was saved from the coronavirus, which does not exist. This one I don't have subtitles to, but I can simply explain the context, which is these women um, are performing a ritual to, um, to cast coronavirus out of the country. Um, and then a man who's not taking it very seriously joins them, pretends to um, be part of the ritual, but is really making fun of them. And I don't think you really need the words so much. Будем бороться с коронавирусом, чтобы он не попал в нашу Россию. Победим. Вот таким образом. Право три раза. Влево три раза. Обкуриваем корону вирус. Там он не придет. Вниз вверх. Коронавирус больше к нам не придет. Мы оградились обкуривание нашу страну, нашу Россию. Мы сейчас будем бороться с коронавирусом, уничтожать его. И будем сжечь костры. Вот так. А что вы делаете? Что такое? What are you doing? Мы зажигаем костры, уничтожать коронавирус, чтобы он не попал в Россию. Да вы что? Да. Шикарно. Тебе тоже надо научиться. Да, научите тоже шефа, как правильно. Так. И вот таким образом мы разгоняем огнем коронавирус. Восьмерку, шеф, крути восьмерку. восьмерку. Make it figure eight. Коронавируса. Отлично, отлично. Я думаю, не пройдет. What's great about these two videos, of course, is that um, the stock characters who are coming in to do the crackpot stuff are, are um, old women, babushki. Um, and they're using um, adapted uh, folk techniques. But if you, compare that, if you compare it to the denialism we see in the United States, um, I find it much more pre much preferable. They don't, they're not, um, they're not shouting at people. They're not trying to reopen things by force. They're just using their um, interesting magic powers. And this guy's going along with it, having a laugh. Um, and the woman, of course, does not seem to understand that she's being made fun of. Um, all right, so clearly all of this is not um, isolated, uh, um, ironically at a time we're talking a great deal about isolation. Um, cor the coronavirus lets us watch um, memes and viral content evolve in real time, um, and again, cross borders. A lot of the memes that you can find in um, the Russian internet about coronavirus, a lot of them are translated from English. And I bring this up not to go back to the sort of eternal complaint about um, Russia being a country that's um, always second and always copying. It's, Russia is not unusual in this at all. Um, it's simply the fact that, uh, that these things um, spread so well um, and people are so uh, willing to translate them into their local languages so that they're available. Um, and of course, no one really claims authorship of memes on the internet, so it doesn't really matter very much. Um, this is happening all over the world. Um, 
but uh, one thing we do see is how certain types of um, Western memes that have become sort of russified, become very popular in Russia, then adapt themselves um, a bit for the coronavirus. And to talk about um, the connection between Western memes and Russian memes and to um, set up something for one big set of memes, I want to, we need to think of, um, we need to look at um, a very, now kind of old, but a very popular mimetic phenomenon first in the West and, and then in Russia, and that is um, the memes. Um, this is a meme that comes from the television show, The Walking Dead. Um, for those of you who don't know, The Walking Dead is a story about a um, zombie apocalypse, quite relevant today. Um, the main character, Rick Grimes, um, his wife, Lori, is uh, pregnant for the first three seasons because time is passes slowly in a, in a zombie apocalypse, not as slowly as it does now, apparently. Um, and his wife, Lori, dies giving birth. Not only does she die giving birth, um, but in order to save the baby, their son, uh, uh, who's about 12 years old, their son, Carl, has to perform a C-section on her to save the baby and kill her. Um, so when that's all over, Carl walks out, Rick sees Carl and realizes that his wife is dead and just goes into a sort of meltdown. But the images of Rick um, crying and screaming about his dead wife while Carl is standing there on the internet turned into a scene of Carl standing there and his father either berating him or making fun of him um, and or making dad jokes and it always ends with him repeating uh, repeating the last few words he said um, in his punchline and Carl it's always about going back to saying Carl again and part of that has to do with the um, intense fake southern accent that the British actor who plays Rick uses in the show um, so the Carl series makes its way to Russia and becomes hugely popular. Um, so we have here, um, Dad, I need new, um, I need new toys. Um, and the second panel, when, when I was a child, um, I, had a, uh, um, I had a box full of toys. And um, you know what I played with more often? The box, the box, Carl. That's how it always ends up, whatever it is, and then Carl. Then they get kind of meta. Um, everybody's posting this meme about Carl. Where did it come from? I don't understand where it came from. Where, Carl? Um, I had to watch that series to understand all these jokes about Carl. Jokes about Carl, Carl. And Papa, Dad, I'm, 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 I'm scared. Why am I speaking Russian? You understand, Carl, the jokes about you, um, they were, they're already really irrelevant, but they came to Russia only in 2015. 2015, Carl. So at this point, um, they're completely self-referential. Um, and Navalny, Alexei Navalny, the, the um, big opposition figure, um, uses this joke um, at one point here when, when he puts up a sign saying, primaries, Carl. Um, and it's a sort of in-joke thing that shows that, that Navalny is hip, and if you don't get it, you are not. Um, Navalny and his brother were on trial when he of the nonsense that the people were saying in trial. He says, as far as I can tell, all you guys are saying again and again is I am Groot. So he is a master of um, using pop cultural slang and pop cultural phrasing. Um, okay, so we're gonna return to Carl in a minute. Carl's going to have a little comeback, um, but, I, but I've set up Carl because Carl is a big, in, big mimetic figure who is uh, available to have almost anything done with him. And um, just before coronavirus starts, um, we have a new, um, hugely popular meme that also um, is flexible and usable for just about anything. And this is a meme um, about Natasha and the cats. Many of you, I think, have seen this meme. It started out in December 2019 um, in a format that is not what we, what, um, we, we now see. So name Natasha, we actually see her, we never see her again. And the cat's saying, Natasha, are you, are you, um, are you asleep? It's, it's morning. Um, Natasha, we knocked everything over. Uh, we, we basically knocked everything over, Natasha, really. Um, stop, uh, stop pretending. We can see that you've raised your eyebrows. Um, the person who wakes up early um, is, uh, is the one who, uh, I can't actually read it. Anyway, so um, this was the original setup. It was, you know, it was nice, but it really takes off when the format changes. And instead of seeing Natasha, it's all from the point of view of Natasha looking up at the cats. Um, and um, again and again, it's this setup, and it starts out, Natasha, Natasha, you sleeping? It's six o'clock, Natasha. Uh, get up, we've, we've knocked everything over. We basically knocked everything over, Natasha, it's, it's true. Um, Natasha, are you asleep? It's six o'clock, uh, it's six in the morning, Natasha. Oil is, um, oil is $32 a barrel. Um, 
uh, or 72 rubles. Get up. We've, um, we've, not, we've knocked over everything. We've knocked over everything, Natasha, um, honestly. Um, Natasha, are you sleeping? Um, we've bought up all of the toilet paper um, and we just uh, unraveled the last roll of it. Um, we even bought up all the newspapers, Natasha, honestly. Natasha, are you sleeping? Um, the, children, the kids have, uh, um, are awake. We're afraid, Natasha. Um, they knocked us over. They dropped us. Basically, they've knocked over everything. Um, can we uh, come sit with you, Natasha? Are you asleep, Natasha? Um, lie down, lie around some more, Natasha. Don't get up. Sit home. Um, we've already closed everything off. Basically, don't even bother going out. So what happens with this meme is um, it exists not for the coronavirus, but once the coronavirus and sheltering in place comes in, the idea of being stuck in, a, stuck in your apartment with these cats demanding things of you becomes particularly uh, relevant. Um, uh, Natasha, they say we have to um, stay home for a month. A month, Natasha, until May 1st, four weeks. What are we going to eat, Natasha? We don't even have much kasha. Um, and what about... Um, and what about um, Easter, and what about uh, shashlik, um, whatever that's called. <laughs> okay. uh, citizen, wake up. Uh, we, ha uh, we had to um, shock you with a taser. Where's your QR code? Um, and why did you go more than meters from your house? Um, you, you have to pay a million ruble fine. This is about the, the restrictions on, on leaving your house, obviously. Um, uh, Natasha, they say we have to wear a mask. Uh, we want masks too. We need them. Uh, Natasha, get up and make masks for us. Have, have a conscience. Have a heart. We need 10 of them. Um, uh, we'll sell them to the uh, neighbor's cats. We're panicking. Um, Natasha, how are we supposed to go after our mice without masks? Um, Natasha, are you asleep? Uh, we, we've already done everything. We've, we've passed the Constitution. We've passed... Um, uh, we've passed the amendments, we've accepted um, autocracy. Um, get up and pretend that you voted. Um, cocaine. Um, uh, Russian, um, we've, we've, uh, Russian, we have accepted everything, honestly. This is in reference to the fact that, we, that Russia was supposed to have a vote about the new constitutional amendments that, um, that uh, Putin was uh, proposing that would basically let him stay in office um, for another 100 years. Um, and that's been mixed up to the whole di in the whole discourse of the coronavirus because, of course, you can't go out and vote. Um, this one is about uh, your biological clock, when you're gonna have children. Natash, because of this isolation, we've, we've gone a bit wild. Um, get up, you get up, you moron. New jokes about Natasha. Um, you, you have no girlfriend, you have no money. Um, all you have is memes on your mind. Um, just at least go clean something. Um, we've, um, we've shat all over everything. Okay, Natasha, I was the one to wake her up first. Um, come to me. She's mine. No, don't, uh, don't be afraid. So now everyone is after her. And now here the, the cats are in mask. Um, we've isolated everybody. We've basically isolated everybody, honestly, Natasha. Um, and then finally, Carl. Wake up, Carl. It's 2020. There's a pandemic. Wake up, Carl. Um, we've, we've knocked over everything. It's pandemic, Carl. Now um, Natasha is, fashion, is, is, is the latest thing, Carl which leads us to the Carl meme about Natasha. Um, Carl, do you know that instead of saying Carl, people say Natash, Natash Carl. Um, so it all gets all rather um, mixed up with, its, with, mixed up with its, um, itself. Now the great thing, one of the great things about um, the setup of the N Natasha meme um, is that you know, they're looking, you have the perspective of them looking down at you, right? Which is like you're waking up in the morning. So if you think about the fact that we're looking at a screen, um, it's like those moments on TV when you're watching someone on TV who's looking at the TV. So in a sense, the TV becomes a portal be, um, or a sort of two-way mirror um, that you are looking through on one side and the characters are looking through on the other. Um, the same thing is happening with our screens um, with these memes. The cats are on one side of the screen, we're on the other. Um, it's as if the screen is a portal from their world to ours, which is perfect for a pandemic because of course, all we have are screens. Everything is coming through us to our phones. And really, why should we bother getting up. We should just lie there and look at our screens. Okay, so the video that I wanted to, sh that I wanted to show you um, that I was trying to um, subtitle but got sick of subtitling, fortunately, was translated already by the Russian reader on his website. Um, we have the text of it that um, Sasha is going to put up on um, chat 
And some of you have already seen this, but it's worth, it's certainly worth um, seeing. It's always fun. Masianya is a, an internet phenomenon that she was on TV for a little while. It's a cartoon that was started, I believe, in 2001. Um, it's all the work of one man who um, does uh, the writing, he does the animation, he does... Um, he's done it off and on since then. There have been a few years here and there when he has not um, produced new Masianya episodes. And Masianya is... Um, Masianya is beloved in part because she's so um, energetic and obnoxious. Her, one of her great, the things she always says is, Gouliet! she wants to go out and she wants to party, which is a problem for someone during isolation. So this, is, this isolation episode is about what Masianya and her friends are doing um, during isolation. This is a huge hit of the Russian internet. It's just a few minutes. So let us go see it. Oh, whoops, sorry. Hold on a second. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to loop here. Okay. I'm going to open it up here. Полный карантин. Больше наружу не выходим вообще больше никогда. Что? Вообще совсем никогда? Ой, да ладно, ничего хорошего в этой наружи никогда и не было. Наружа! Вот даже по слову видно, противно такое слово. Так вот, наружа это насилие, болезни, политика, грязь, вирусы, хамство, воровство и прочее говно. Ничего хорошего там нет, забудьте, все, проехали. Да, это, кстати, Бродский. Он поживет тут у нас на диванчике какое-то время. Чё, какой еще Бродский? Какого хрена? Меня никто не спрашивал. И выходи из комнаты, не совершай ошибку. Да заткнись ты, бро. Да нас в этой жизни вообще мало кто о чем спрашивает. Ничего не поделаешь, Шрёдер, придётся тебе с ним жить. За дверью бессмысленно все. А как мы продукты-то будем у посыльного забирать? Ну а ты пробели-ка такую маленькую дверцу внизу, чтоб только коробка пролазила. Да не хочу я дверь портить, ты чё? Ну тогда только пиццу заказывать будем. Такую на тонком тесте, чтоб под дверь пролазила. Вот такая вкуснее гораздо. Надо бы это режим соблюдать. Режим, вот и режим. И гимнастикой нужно тут каждый день того этого. Ну да, на лучшей ночью. И вставать утром в 8. А ложиться в 27. И выучить японский язык. Ну да, кось, валяй, начинай. А я готов заниматься. Опять ты. Опять ты. Опять ты. Опять ты! Опять ты! Стой, сука, я знаю, это опять ты! Я проснулась. И нахрена спрашивается? Не знала, что ты такой любитель шпрот, Хрюндель. Твоя девичья фамилия часом не шпротман. Какой черт тебе столько вина, Масянь? Самое тупое, Хрюндель, что можно сделать, когда придет конец света, это быть трезвым. Понял? Чё дела наши идут, мой японский друг? Херовато. Опять ты! Так, внимай мне, народ ячейки номер 15. Что скажу? Короче, был такой путешественник и писатель Турхир Дал. Чего дал, простите? О, дети, воткните уши. Хер! Хер дал! Фамилия такая, факт тебя побери. Дети, откройте уши. Подожди, а как вы это слышали? Э, ладно. Короче, Турхир дал. И уплыл. Стоп, стоп, стоп. Короче. Турхир дал путешественник. В своей книжке про путешествие на Кондике написал, что экипаж иногда отпускал сзади на веревке, сзади на веревке корабля небольшой такой шлюп. Шлюп, шлюп, шлюп. Тихо. Шлюп. 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 Короче, шлюп, в котором сидел чувак, который весь остальной экипаж сильно задолбал. Типа немного отдохнуть от общества и дорогих любимых близких людей. Понятно? Мы с вами в такой же ситуации, так что спальня теперь такой вот шлюп. 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 Тихо. Шлюп. Шлюп. Короче, будет тошнить кого от общества? Всех нас. Каждый имеет право заявить о том, что у него проблемы, и удалиться туда и сидеть там один. Всем ясно? Чуя первая. 
Не выходи из комнаты, считай, что тебя продуло. Эй, Масянь, а у Бро, что тоже своя очередь будет? Не будь дураком, будь тем, чем другие не были. Интересная мысль. Ну чё, ну чё там на улице? Зомби есть? Не, вообще никого нету. Эй, ну что за вирус, блин, отстой. Фу. Блин, этого нет, этого нет, этого нет. Чё жрать-то? Я могу питаться пивом. Алло, лохматый, а ты, а ты там что поделываешь? Да я-то в порядке. Я с девушками знакомлюсь. Мне так даже больше нравится. О, в GTA играешь? Тут, короче, нужно всех застрелить, вот сюда ворваться, ограбить, потом угнать эту машину. Эй, -э -э, стоп, Хрендер, я просто гуляю. По морю похожу, в магазин зайду, в кафешку. Зачем вы тут все стрелять там, убивать там, крошить там? Это хорошо было до вируса. Что, прям так выйти наружу? Ну да, отменили же карантин. Давай, валяй, гуляй. Наружу. А, что это небо? Ого. Говно какое-то. Слушай, да ну хрень для этого наружу, одни неприятности от нее. Я тебе лес в VR покажу, закачаешься. Красиво и без говна. Пошли обратно, давай обратно заколоть. Хорошо было. Заплись и забаррикадируйся шкафом от хроноса, космоса, эроса, расы, вируса. А ты валяй отсюда, бро! Все из-за тебя было с самого начала. Валяй, валяй! Так, друзья мои дорогие, не киснем, чувство юмора не теряем, поддерживаем Масяню на Патреоне. Сериал существует только благодаря вашим баксам. Я понимаю, что бакс сейчас до хрена стоит, вообще деньги нужны. Но скинуться можно буквально по одному, и сериал будет жить. Спасибо всем, удачи, переживем и это. Фигня. So, Масяня, um... Lots of great stuff there. First of all, I think it's just loads of fun. Um, but the use of Brodsky, for one, I, I rarely see Brodsky um, treated as a figure of fun like this, so that's um, quite uh, quite entertaining. But also, there's a whole thing here about the different about the connections between the inside and the outside. Um, in a way, um, Brodsky was invading our um, social media feeds for a while. You could you you could not. Um, you could not miss him. And granted, it's not a big deal, but, um, um, but turning it into Brodsky being in your home, declaiming his poem over and over again, um, I think is a nice little way of playing with uh, um, how we are exposed to these same memes again and again um, on, um, online when we're stuck at home. And then also the idea that Grand Theft Auto becomes a place where you go just to walk around and not shoot people because it's just so much fun to walk around um, is a nice twist on the whole um, way in which playing video games is usually troped by people who um, are against video games. It's all about violence and it's all about escapism. And here the escapism um, is literally about just escaping your apartment and being somewhere else. Um, and then the idea that we can um, adapt too much to being stuck in our homes um, and never want to leave uh, which also is a really common critique of um, younger generations and their internet use, um, and to have that thrown back at what is now kind of an older generation um, and imagining that this becomes our new normal um, is at the very least amusing. Okay, um, a few other things that, have, that um, people are doing on the Russian internet, um, mimetically, virally, um, is taking uh, the subjects of classic paintings and reinterpreting them in terms of um, the virus. We already saw a couple of those. Um, in particular, this doctor figure. Now, now throughout the world, there's a whole um, subset of memes, which is basically um, inserting a, um, a person's image into um, other images to make it kind of funny. There's a very um, famous one in Russia about the, the guy who's called the witness, who's put in everywhere. But here, this doctor visits famous paintings and tells people to break it up because they're not observing social distancing. Um, break it up again. Um, break it up. And this one, um, where he says, Не держитесь, don't hold on, um, is actually um, has um, a, a bunch of references, but in particular, I think goes back to a couple of years ago when um, former Prime Minister, former President Dmitry Medvedev was confronted by people who um, were living in extreme poverty somewhere in the provinces. And um, they asked, you know, what kind of uh, how are you going to help us? He says, well, we don't have any, there's no money to give you, there's nothing we can do. Dirgitis, hold on, just keep keep holding on, which people immediately made fun of, like, well, thank you, that's great advice. And now here's someone who looks an awful like, like Medvedev um, saying, no, don't hold on, because of course now it's um, dangerous. 
And one of the big images circulating around is um, from the popular Soviet era um, chocolate called Ayonka, which is a girl's name. They add the uh, letters Ude, you get Udayonka, which is a um, uh, sort of slang for, um, for remote connection, remote learning. And of course she has the mask over her face. Um, and finally, when it comes to paintings, that we have the phenomenon where Russia at last invades Western mimetic space because there's a um, mimetic phenomenon that has gotten so big that it was actually written up in the New York Times, which for um, American elite culture means it's arrived, that it doesn't exist unless it's in, in the New York Times. And that is um, the Facebook group called Isolation, where um, numerous people starting in St. Petersburg, but throughout Russia and then eventually throughout the world, um, uh, pose and recreate um, classic paintings with the materials in their apartments. Now, granted, they do it so well, um, I always wonder how they manage to, um, to f photograph it so perfectly and what kind of equipment they have, but um, it can be rather fun. So you have Madonna and Child with um, a real person and a child, um, another reproduction going in. The discus thrower. There are other discus throwers, but I like this guy in his kitchen. Here, here, and the Rene Magritte um, image. Um, so the isolation series, there's not anything necessarily particularly Russian about it. Um, some of the paintings are, are Russian, some of them are not. Um, one could argue that uh, Russia is a place where you can find lots of people who actually know something about art and therefore are going to reproduce it. But they're really, I think in any country large enough with a, with a big enough um, educated base, um, you can make this work even, even in America. Um, but I also can't help but think of this all as an unintentional, spontaneous parody of what I think was the main message of um, Sakurov's uh, big art film, Russian Ark, which was the film that was famously um, shot in one long take at the Hermitage. Um, and was very tendentious about um, the role of Russia and the West and so on and so forth. And um, by the end, um, the sense we're getting is that the Hermitage, which um, in, in, in St. Petersburg, which is a collection entirely of Western, not Russian art, art is kind of an arc that Russia is using, that Russia is using to um, preserve world culture from, European culture from catastrophe because Europe can't preserve it itself. Um, and now we have this twist on it where the entire world is kind of going to hell and um, individual Russians not in, apart in, in museums, but and not even in apartment museums, but just in apartments are, um, are in their own way, um, not necessarily preserving, but reproducing world culture. Um, in a particularly mimetic fashion, mimetic both in the sense that it's um, becoming internet memes and also in the sense that it's um, copying something but with a particular twist. Okay, um, then there is um, then there is the way in which uh, the uh, mimetic content is particularly useful for um, satirizing um, uh, state responses to the virus, um, and in particular, there was the moment that um, when Putin. Um, was talking about how we can, we, Russia, can um, cope with the virus. Now, there's a long tradition, certainly a Putin era tradition, of, of, refer, of trying to connect um, current events, current problems with the greatness of Russian past. Almost everything is about World War II, the great victory. And here, um, it almost immediately turns into a self-parody when um, Putin says, yes, we can, we can survive this. We survive the Polovsians and the Pechenegs. We can survive anything. Now, um, the Polovsians and the Pechenegs were, uh, you know, so-called barbarian, barbarian um, groups that invaded Rus, and, you know, most Russians with an education would have heard of them, um, but they're not exactly um, anywhere in the top 10 or even top 50 possible enemies of Russia. Um, one interpretation of this is as a way of once again reproducing this notion of Russia under siege, Russia, Russia um, that is being beset by enemies, but not actually connecting it to any specific enemies that people go out and target. They're not gonna go out in the street and beat up Polovsians. Um, but um, this immediately became something of the subject of ridicule. So um, here we have Putin that says, this, um, this, uh, this is a sword and we need to use it to beat the Pechenegs. Oh, we have some tweets. Um, so one of the things that's, that's great about Pechenegs and Polovsians is, is, Pech, is, is Pechenex sounds a bit like Pichinia, cookies, and Polovsian sounds a little bit like swimmers. Um, and then there's this whole context of this uh, internet, this deliberately um, misspelled internet speak called Yuzik um, Padonko uh, or Albansky, where everything is written wrong. So here it's um, 
take your pechen eggs um, and um, and have some and have some polovtsi too. But they're just swimmers. Um, here's the pechen eggs. Um, one of them saying, "So, are we trending on Google? On Google? No, the polovtsians are." More cats. Um, we've um, we've uh, We've, we've um, handled, uh, handled bigger things. We beat the Pechenegs and the Polovsians and the Polovsians too. And here's a gingerbread man, man Pecheneg on the attack. Some great tweets. Um, me, I hope that Putin will stop constantly rem um, talking about the uh, great patriotic war and will find something else that, that Russia can be proud of. Putin, Pechenegs. And another one at the bottom. Um, I want to put a sticker on my car um, with a um, an image of a pechenegg and it was saying um, we can repeat this, which is a, the big slogan from about um, repeating uh, World War II, the World War II victory at this time, perhaps against the Americans. Um, okay. Well, of course, um, nature um, nature during uh, the pandemic has has. Um, become so pure now that um, in Russia, the Pechenegs have returned. It's sort of like the dolphins returning and all of that. Putin before the quarantine or Putin after the quarantine? Putin before the quarantine saying constitution, Putin after the, the quarantine saying, oh, you Pechenegs, because of course his constitutional plans are a little bit um, uh, interfered with by all of this. And of course, Natasha. Natasha, wake up. Um, we've been tortured by the Polos, the, the Polosians, and the Pechenegs tortured us, Natasha, and the, coronav and the coronavirus infection, Natasha, um, honestly. Uh, Natasha, wake up. The Pechenegs have taken all of our money, and the Polosians, they've taken everything, Natasha, honestly. Natasha, are you asleep? Um, they're Pechenegs everywhere, Natasha. Um, they're, 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 they've arranged a raid. They're asking, they're demanding tribute. Um, wake up, put on your armor quickly. Do you have a, a grab, grab your shield, um, be, uh, then, we'll, then we'll go after the Polovsians and the coronavirus. Um, don't wake up, Natasha. We, um, we tried, Natasha. Um, we've all, we, 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 we're done with the Pechenegs, Natasha. We, we managed, we, we, um, we beat the Pechenegs and we figured things out with the Polovsians also and the uh, coronavirus uh, infection. Um, but the, uh, the coronavirus has all gone to shit, Natasha. And now instead of the cats, we have images of the Polovsians or, or, um, or Pechenegs. Uh, wake up, Natasha, they've, um, uh, they've beaten us, Natasha. Oh, there's actually Russians, I'm sorry. The, um, uh, the Pechenegs and the Polovsians, honest. Um, wake up, Natasha, there's a lot to do. Uh, you've got to collect, tri gather tribute. Um, and, um, and you've got to uh, impale people on, on, the, um, on the stick. Okay, so. All right. And then the last big political moment is Putin during the coronavirus going out to a hospital wearing a, a yellow um, hazmat suit. And um, you know, Putin is no stranger to the media. Uh, and Putin's body is an important site of, um, of Russian symbolic power. And that's one of the reasons why there's been so much attention to um, Putin enacting masculinity, Putin enacting strength, Putin shirtless, Putin Putin wrestling with various wild animals and so on and so forth. Um, uh, this, this image of this kind of untouchable um, Superman, uh, which is really compromised when he's wearing a uh, yellow hazmat suit. Um, we have Putin overdressed rather than underdressed um, and it makes him vulnerable. And so immediately his image gets um, plugged into all sorts of great contexts like um, Putin in a hazmat suit in the Teletubbies, um, uh, here he is from Breaking Bad. This is the image of him um, walking in, uh, through the Kremlin gates. We see it again and again, but now he's in a hazmat suit. Um, here he is in some rundown provincial town. Here he is as a food delivery guy. Um, so what does this all come to? The great thing is that the, the coronavirus as a virus is the perfect viral story, the perfect viral phenomenon. Um, in a sense, the entire internet is taking the coronavirus challenge and the virus knows no borders as the internet knows few borders. Closing borders really rarely helps. But you can process um, this global phenomenon locally and the way you process it locally is going to have a lot in common with, the, with um, things outside of the local but then also have its own specificity. And you process the politics. Um, there's this terrible neologism um, that's come up in studies of globalization in the past couple of decades, um, combining the global and the local to make the global, that is this um, way in which the global has its specific um, local 
uh, manifestations of phenomena. And what I would say, if I were comfortable with this word, and I really do hate this word, but still, if I were comfortable with it, I would say that what we're seeing here with the coronavirus um, as a mimetic phenomenon um, on the Russian internet is um, a kind of glocalization of the coronavirus. That is all I wanted to say. Thank you for uh, bearing with me. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. All right, uh, we're ready to take some questions if anybody has them. Natasha, All right. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Nadezhda. If you, I'm going to call on you now. Um, go ahead. Thank you very much, Elliot, for this nice presentation. Um, I saw just uh, a part of that memes, uh, and they are wonderful, of course. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I have just a short comment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm associate professor at the university, and um, I produce a sort of uh, subject matter for you. Yeah. And if you want, you can share. <laughs> Please, thank um, you. Uh, some pictures. Um, I teach digital humanities uh, at the university, uh, and we have um, some uh, classes uh, on licensing of digital heritage, uh, pictures uh, on a variety of uh, topics. And uh, the, the task uh, I provided for my students is about memes uh, on coronavirus and all this situation. Uh, and some of them were so fantastic and they were related to uh, their um, internal feelings about the situation, about living uh, in this um, not really safety environment. Some of them were related about um, some problems and difficulties uh, with um, academic staff uh, and uh, where this tasks and, and online, this remote uh, education. So if you want, you can share uh, these slides. Love. Nothing really, everything is very ethical. Uh, and if you want, you can show right now. But uh, if it's a sort of restriction, uh, I can send uh, uh, these um, uh, images uh, via email. I, I would love it if you could send them to me. I think that would, that would be really, really helpful. And I'm sure your students um, have seen many, many more memes than I have. So I'd be very grateful. What city are you in? Um, I'm associate professor uh, at university and um, uh, these current classes were about digital humanities and digital heritage uh, as a topic uh, uh, within the, the main discipline. Right. Uh, so the task was to produce uh, memes uh, on the this global pandemic situation. Okay. If you want, you can share if it's uh, allowed. Can I? Um, well, I think if you want to make it available in chat or something, that's great. I, th I think we should probably continue with the questions. I would love to see them, certainly. But I okay. think... I, think, um, I will. Um, yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, so, um, uh, and if uh, I can, I would like to um, uh, say that it's a great job you do. It's a really interesting stuff uh, to, uh, to research, to investigate. Uh, and um, my uh, main question is about uh, the sources. Uh, is it only Facebook? Uh, and uh, do you consider the popularity of these memes or you just collect everything you have? Mm -hmm. Thank you. But that's an excellent question. So um, I get them. I get them from wherever I can find them. I get them from Facebook. I get them from Twitter. I get them from Google and Yandex searches. Um, I don't. I, to the extent that I have a methodology, which I don't really, I don't really um, do a lot in terms of um, of um, searching for numbers. My feeling is if it's if I find it in searches and if people keep posting it, it probably means something to someone. Um, I don't know um, exactly how things are. Most of the memes that I showed today I've seen um, in, in, in multiple places, which suggests to me that they've, and I, they come up in my Facebook feed again and again, I see them on Twitter again and again, suggests that they have circulated widely. Certainly, certainly the isolation memes and the Natasha memes and Carl, of course. So um, I don't think I got to anything obscure enough yet to worry about whether or not anyone's seen it. These are all really obvious memes. Okay, thank you. 
Great. Uh, we have a question from Maya. Uh, Elliot, can you talk a little bit more about the treatment of Brodsky in the Mysianya cartoon? Um, it's just so irreverent. Um, and you know, th there has been plenty of room for irreverence for um, Russian cultural figures um, in, uh, in literary circles and mass culture over the past several decades. But to, but to treat Brodsky this way um, is, I think, a little bit shocking. Um, in that, for one thing, he, his, he um, died not that long ago. He is clearly a martyr for the regime. His poetry is very much alive and admired and very complicated. Um, and um, to not like Brodsky is to be kind of Philistine. Um, and yet, there's something very uh, immediately recognized. There, there are idiosyncrasies of Brodsky that people tend not to stress when they are um, uh, praising Brodsky, like the, the sort of droning way in which he reads his poetry. Um, so it's very consistent with Masyanya to be this irreverent. Um, and maybe I'm not like, not, um, not right circles for this, um, but it's, in a sense, it's kind of, it, Brodsky becomes fair game once he's quoted on the internet all the time as someone who has said something relevant for you right now. Um, then in a way, he may as well be a celebrity you can make fun of. Um, because he's circulating out there kind of like Putin is. Um, it's a terrible comparison, I realize, and it's not something that he has made himself do. I can't even imagine Brodsky's internet presence if he were around today. Um, but um, it's, I, all I can say is I just love um, this clash of um, very, very rarefied high culture with the crassness of the internet and the crassness of, of Masyanya um, that um, still, I think, has a little bit of a, of a, of a zing to it for being um, unusual. Okay, and we have a question from Andrea. I'm going to unmute you. Hi, um, Elliot, can you hear me? Yes, yes, hey Andrea. Um, yeah, that, that was really interesting. So, uh, I, so this picture of Putin in the, in the hazmat suit, there, uh -huh. there's, there's a sort of, there's a number of, photos I've seen of him that are sort of hospital Putin in a hospital with uh, in a white coat giving flowers to new moms things like that and so this hospital Putin image is in is in stark contrast with the image of Mike Pence not wearing a mask this week and just wearing a regular business suit and has anybody on the in the in the sites that you look at has anybody noticed that contrast between Pence and Putin? These two different images, I guess, of masculinity. Someone must have. I haven't seen it, but yeah, it does seem to kind of um, the question does seem to ask itself a bit. Um, what what I think is is interesting about the contrast is um, the the very different context. In that, by the time that Pence is visiting the hospital, and there are you know. Granted, we had a period when everybody was saying, don't wear a mask, and now I'm supposed to wear a mask. And it is actually really aggravating that I went around telling people don't wear a mask because people told me not to wear a mask. Now we always have to wear a mask. Fine, okay. Um, it is a, there is a little Orwellian feeling of jumping on the bandwagon here, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, so now when everybody is supposed to be wearing masks, um, he is out there not wearing a mask. Um, and um, it's outrageous on that level. Whereas when Putin was with the hazmat suit, um, it was, that moment was kind of shocking because um, at that particular point, if I'm not mistaken, the Russian media were not really playing up the idea that you have to take all of these huge precautions and go around in um, masks, let alone a hazmat suit. So uh, when, you, when you're, you're hearing mixed messages about how things are not so bad and then your leader is in a full hazmat suit, um, that, um, that is not just funny, it's kind of frightening um, and suggests uh, that you're not being told everything. Um, the, the flip side with, with Putin and Trump is we're being told things, but these idiots can't hear it. So, um, so that would be, I think, a, a big point of contrast. And we have a question from Alexandra, if you wanna unmute yourself. Or I'll unmute you, there you go. Hi everyone again, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi. Yeah, so I was really struck by the uh, by the videos you showed at the beginning of the session of the old ladies, yeah. right? The two of them. So um, struck because I've never I've never seen them before, and yet, well, 
well, I'm on the internet and trying to keep track of uh, Russian coronavirus memes, and I've seen all the other, or, or at least I've been aware of the yeah. uh, Natasha memes and the, the policy memes, all, all that, and but not the not the old ladies trying to smoke coronavirus out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, lo I, I lo looked them up, and I discovered that they are some sort of a well, that, that the videos are staged. Ah. Uh, yes, and that they are they are they are real old ladies from Krasnodar, which is a uh, southern uh, city uh, in Russia, and they are part of some kind of a well, what would I call them? A movement, a movement. Uh, Putin, Put, Atriade Putin, that is uh, Putin's squad, right? The Putin yeah. squad, and they've been around for a while. They've uh, they've been sort of like anti-feminine uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a way, but uh, pro pro government, um, known notorious even. Uh, Known for uh, attacking uh, attacking Nav uh, Nav Navalny campaign office in Krasnodar, attacking mm -hmm. position gatherings and all that, and uh, and there's a man behind them uh, yeah. who organizes and probably funds the whole thing, and so I wanted yeah, and so that was all uh, quite uh, quite interesting to learn, uh, and I wanted to hear your opinion about the difference between. Between the organic memes, like the Natasha meme, right, and all its well re, uh, repetitions uh, and various uh, various uh, yeah, iterations, and uh, and these staged things that are funny, right, and uh, mind-boggling, but also well, they are staged, so they are not organic. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's something that is both incredibly meaningful and both really important and unimportant depending on the context you look at it, right? Because, so um, I did not, you know, this is, I, here I'm making a presentation, I did not do that research, probably should have, but the point is that, um, so on the one level, yes, it is staged, someone thought to do this, doesn't surprise me too much because of course it's um, filmed fairly well and all of that, there, there's someone there filming it. Um, so, that's, that question, I think, is particularly relevant when, um, when it's a question of, say, real political action versus astroturf. Like the question is being asked right now about um, the uh, people who are protesting outside of the state houses um, in states throughout the US, right? Um, if it's being set up as a spontaneous thing, that's one thing. If we find out it's all Koch brothers' money, it means something very different. But, the, but yet again, it means a third thing in that we're just consuming these images and not um, knowing where they come from and they have an effect. So with, with um, mimetic and viral content on the internet, there is a way in which it doesn't matter if it's staged as long as it's received. Um, but when you think of them in terms of, of their political role and their political effect, I think the staging is important. I'm not surprised here that they're staged because there's something about the way that these women conducted themselves that was really, really familiar to me. Um, I, I had assumed that they were probably connected to that whole really bizarre movement with, I can't remember what it's called, but where, where the people are really convinced that like, you know, um, the word um, uh, Sviet and Svitoy are the same word, the, the, the people who are talking about the weird roots of Russian language and, and doing sort of the magic power of Russian, you haven't seen this stuff? Um, Veda? Yes, Veda thank you. Yeah, the Veda, it's the Veda. Veda. It's, it's Veda, yeah, and, it, and it's Veda adjacent. Um, mm -hmm. they, they reminded me of these people, right? Um, so, um, so I'm not surprised that they're part of an organization. Now, the fact that someone staged it, then the que my next question would be, okay, so why do you stage it and what do you think the effect is going to be? Because it's hard to imagine, it's hard to imagine that there are people out there who are, say, skeptical about, um, who, who are receptive, people who aren't that crazy, receptive to the idea that the coronavirus is fake and then convinced because there are these old ladies out there who are waving around their hands and burning stuff. Um, that, I hope that's a niche um, audience. Um, I could be wrong about that. So I'm just not sure how effective that is as a political tool. What, what do you think? Well, since uh, it's been only like about half an hour since I learned about uh, <laughs> existence, I yeah. will take a rain check. On that. <laughs> uh, I will continue thinking about it. Yes. Let me know what you, if you have any ideas, please let me know. Thank you. We have a question from David. Uh, David, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. Hey, Elliot. How are you doing? Hey, David. Good to see you. Uh, 
Good to see you. Um, I, I binge watched your first uh, four episodes so I could catch up. Um, and, and one thing I, I've been wondering is about, you know, the creation of uh, a Russian Internet. I mean, we hear about the Russian Internet as a yeah. way, you know, as something that's a thing in the way that we don't hear about other countries having a national Internet. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent, I mean, obviously part of it is created by language and, you know, access to keyboards and things like that, but also um, state control. Um, in what ways are the limits being set to create a kind of local culture? I mean, some of it's like technology related, like I think of the whole, you know, fact that, you know, Live Journal went Russian for a while and then disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of it is like, you know, is the the problem of, you know, when, you know, I only know of, know of it from scholars who say, hey, I'm in Petersburg, and when I was, you know, back home in whatever university I was in, I could access this website, but now I'm in Petersburg, and I can't get this website because it's blocked. Um, can somebody please send it to me? So in what ways do you see the state setting the limits to create this kind of local culture of memes? Oh, well, that's a really, that's a very complex question, but a really good one. And, and by the way, thank you. I've never been binged before, so I'm really honored. I hope I'm not, I, I hope not to be purged. But um, the, so in terms of the background of developing the Russian internet, my, my, my general uh, on YouTube, there's this documentary produced by Medusa in connection with, um, uh, I'm getting the name, but in, in um, Russian it's called Kholivar, which Russian way, Holy War, and in English it's called Internet. Um, and there are about seven or eight um, half hour segments that are about the history of the creation of the Russian internet. And, it, um, and because of the circumstances under which it's created, that is, you know, um, things just a few years behind where they're happening in the United States, um, and a lot of total ripping off of um, existing structures, like how much contacts you look like Facebook and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of imitation. But what you find out is, um, first, you find out less about state restrictions than you do about absolutely um, vicious turf battles among um, oligarchs and business types. And then it becomes a story of state restrictions. Um, so the state restrictions on the internet, I think, work largely the same way a lot of um, Rus the Russian state laws work and state restrictions work, which is that they're very hit or miss. Chances are, setting aside the blocking of websites, chances are you're not going to come afoul of the law, but you can't be sure you won't. And every now and then there'll be some very public moment, for instance, with someone being prosecuted for, um, for a meme that they've reposted, right? Um, that I think is meant to put the fear of God into everybody. Um, statistically, I, um, you are probably very safe um, posting a lot of um, a, a lot of really subversive content on the internet, um, unless you happen to be an unlucky person. Hmm. Um, it is certainly getting worse now. In terms of blocking real thing for people who really are concerned, you can get a VPN, um, and which um, I think I think the might actually be more of an outlier in this. That is, like, I'm very used to the idea. There's so many places I travel to where I use a VPN. Um, because a lot of countries, including a lot of countries you don't think of as necessarily authoritarian, um, do have restrictions there, and a VPN can be, can be convenient. Um, so I would imagine the ordinary internet user is not bothering with a VPN, extra impediment and an extra um, uh, thing you have to do. But if you want the content, you can get the VPN, um, and, and that will help. Um, All right, um, we have a question from Ola. Uh, Elliot, have you seen any memes uh, with Alexei Navalny in them? Ever? <laughs> Loads, uh, yeah. Um, but actually, interesting question. I see, I think of Alexei Navalny as someone who creates memes more than um, being featured in memes. Hmm. You know, I'm sure I have, but I'm not coming up with them. Olya, have you seen memes with Alexei Navalny in them? No, I haven't. Hmm. But I was wondering if, if he's popular in this universe. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, the real question is the intersection of um, certain type of internet culture and certain types of politics, right? Um, so I would, I would imagine that for a lot of the people out there who are doing the uh, most interesting and creative stuff on, with memes on the internet, Navalny is not a big target um, because Putin's a target. Yeah. However, I would have thought and I would expect 
that at the very least troll farms um, would get on it and make memes about Navalny. They certainly do produce enough anti Navalny content in, um, on blogs and on comments. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly um, troll farms are very good at um, creating and spreading um, particularly pointed memes um, in the West and other sorts of memes in Russia. Um, I haven't investigated this, but I, I, I don't remember seeing very many memes about Navalny. Yeah, probably because he's not as popular, right? <laughs> or, well, not as, or not as, not hated by the right people. Um, that is, I think if, if, a, if a lot of people in the meme community really hated him, um, then he would be, um, he would be a figure. But since, since he's kind of, um, he's, he occupies this kind of um, crusading position of, um, uh, of fighting corruption and all that, and because he's so cool, right, um, in his manner, right, right, right. And because he's so savvy, um, he's not as obvious a target as someone who is a little bit um, stiff or goofy or stupid or funny looking. Um, so he's a, he's a good looking young man who knows how to use the internet. So mm -hmm. I don't think that makes him a great target. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a comment from Alexandra Smith uh, in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, Brodsky died in 1996, but the process of his canonization was controversial in many ways. And the mechanism that uses parody is similar to the treatment of Akhmatova at the mm. end of the 1980s and 90s in the works of Petrushevska and Sarokin. Mm -hmm. no, that's an interesting point. And there's the whole, um, what is it, the Zhelkovsky with Akhmatova, Stalin in a skirt. Um, Absolutely, I do. I do. I, I can see the connection there. It, it still it took it took the same amount of time between what you're saying between Akhmatova's death and this um, debunking of the cult of Akhmatova and Brodsky's death and this um, possible um, uh, barbed um, commentary on on Brodsky. So yeah, it it it, it could be quite similar um, because I I don't really follow the world of Brodsky at all. Um, I haven't. I'm not aware of a larger phenomenon of trying to dismantle dismantle Brodsky besides like from say, say hardcore like nationalist anti-semite types who don't really count for this sort of thing um and so so Alexander and other people you might very well um know of this um but this but this Masyanya video is my first encounter with a um an ironic and as as one of you in the comments put still kind of affectionate approach to Brodsky um it's affectionate but it does have his head spinning around like Linda Blair so it's kind of um comes out in wash I think And we have a question from Yelena. Elliot, what are American coronavirus memes like? How are they different? And what themes do they play with? Mm -hmm. So uh, American coronaviruses, so a lot of them, there, there's a lot of overlap in that I didn't bother showing you a lot of the uh, Russian language memes that are the same as American um, coronavirus memes. So a lot of it is about the whole staying at home stuff, about going crazy, staying at home, killing, you know, um, wanting to kill your, uh, the members of your family, um, just going crazy in isolation. And then of course, anti-Trump memes using coronavirus, anti-Trump memes are such a big phenomenon anyway that it just seems like a, just more material for um, something that has, that has been around. But most of the stuff I see is really about, um, is about being in isolation um, and, uh, um, and about hoarding, isolation and hoarding. All right, and we have a question from Tanya. Uh, what do you make of the platforms by which these memes become viral? Isoliatse seems to be a Facebook thing, not so much an Instagram thing. How about other examples? Do these memes get viral via various channels or the same ones? Is there anything specific to, say, Twitter or TikTok or any generational uh, difference tied to that? That's an excellent question because, of course, Facebook is not necessarily for young people. Um, though uh, there's a big age spread of the people who are in the um, images. And I actually think maybe the demographic of Facebook doesn't map on to the in Russia the way to the demographic of Facebook in, in America. Facebook is still, um, um, I think Facebook is, uh, can play some of the role that Kontaktia had or has. Um, so I see a lot of it in Twitter as well. Um, I don't, I haven't seen much TikTok. I, I haven't seen any TikTok about it. I must admit, I'm not really following that much TikTok um, at all, or Instagram. I think I think it's really just a. Fun, it, I would guess it's more of an accident, right? That this starts out in Facebook, and, that, and that's why um, it lives in Facebook. And if so, 
isolation group and people subscribe to the isolation group, I subscribe to the isolation group. If you want your isolation photo seen, um, it's going to be seen in Facebook. I assume it gets shared in other platforms as well. Um, but uh, the, the home ends up being Facebook. And, and um, my guess is that's just sort of circumstance. But again, I could be wrong about that. And uh, Yelena, you had a question about the cat's meme, if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. And I actually, I, you know, I was thinking about the cat memes and I wonder, my question is in two parts. And first one is, how do you think the memes about the cats trying to wake up Natasha reflect the uh, sentiments of Russians withdrawal from politics mm -hmm. that is particularly aggravated now at the time of isolation and what do you think like now it's kind of projecting forward how how do you see Russians political activity affected by this um, isolation well I think the first question is almost more of a comment and really on point right that that um that this really does reflect very well the sense of withdrawal and isolation from um, it works well with the withdrawal from politics, but the, um, the great thing is that you can see it as withdrawal from politics, but as the world then withdraws itself because of the virus, withdrawal from politics and withdrawal from the world end up looking kind of similar. Um, so, so it's polyvalent. Um, in terms of the effect on politics, um, I just don't know. I mean, I, I think um, it's Russia is facing this, um, the same, roughly the same set of problems that anyone is facing, any country is facing when it comes to political activity and to the, the mechanisms of, um, of voting um, in that it's all, everything is based on the idea that people can go out um, and be on the street. That's both for protesting and for voting. And this, is, this, this strikes me as a really interesting inflection point, right? Because um, one of the big criticisms that people rightly have, I think, of, um, of this kind of internet utopianism and hashtag activism is that um, people sometimes forget that um, it often it doesn't really matter until you have bodies in the street. Um, and that one of the best uses of social media for protest is to get bodies on the street. And that's why, um, that's why countries that are trying to suppress protest try to suppress um, the means by which people get the information to go out on the street. Um, we look at Hong Kong, right, where now you can't really have the protest. So um, it's, it is really terrifying, in fact, if you are someone who is concerned about where your country is going and would normally be taken to the streets, um, that you can't do it. Now, ironically, right in the States, um, people, people whose agenda is the coronavirus is fake, they can take to the streets. Um, uh, there's a Darwinian aspect of it that might take care of that as well, but it, it's going to uh, affect everybody. Um, but anyone who actually believes in science is going to be really restricted. So my worry, and it's certainly not my own worry, and it's certainly not, not original, is that all of this is very, very, can be very convenient for um, a repressive government. Um, because you can't have people out there in force. Now, um, there's also pent up anger. Um, and then maybe the moments when people finally can get out on the street, um, it will be effective. But also, um, in the aftermath of the first waves of the virus, once you start having groups of people out of the street protesting, the government can just say, this is a public health hazard, which it very well might be. Um, so what I don't know is, is there a way of affecting political, real political change that could in fact involve um, making sure that uh, politicians don't overstay their welcome by canceling elections or, or meddling with elections? Is there a way to actually ensure all that without, without leaving your house? Um, and I don't know of a way to do that, um, but I, I hope we figure one out. That's not just Russia's problem though. Thank you. And a uh, question from Dennis, any memes aimed at MTS subsequent to its request for fewer memes from its subscribers? Oh, <laughs> um, so memes about requests for fewer memes? Yeah, have there been any memes about this request aimed I have, at MTS? Yeah, that's great. I haven't looked for that. Um, it's, I would expect there would be because um, through the perverse logic of the internet, the moment you ask people to stop doing something on the internet, they just do it more. Um, so now I wanna look, I would be willing to bet that there's going to be a, um, a plethora of memes about this precisely just to piss off the people asking you not to do memes. Um, that would be very consistent. 
And I think that's all, unless anybody has any last minute questions. All right. Okay, well, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. So I don't know what the topic of my next week's lecture is going to be. There are a few ways I could go, but I, I take requests. So, um, so let me know.